So hello everyone and welcome to how to fix your productivity to amp up your results with Chad Barger. This workshop is going to be recorded and the slides will be shared afterwards so keep your eyes peeled for a follow up email later in case you want to review anything from today. Um, in case this is your first time here, this free grant workshop is an instrumental partner webinar. These are collaborations between instrumental and community partners to provide free educational workshops for grant professionals. Our goal is to tackle a problem that grant professionals often have to solve while sharing different ways instrumentals platform can help grant writers win more grants. Instrumental is the institutional fundraising platform. If you want to bring grant prospecting, tracking, and management to one place, we can help you do that. You can set up your own personalized grant recommendations using the link on the screen here, and I'll share that in the Zoom chat again um, uh, in a few times. Um, and lastly, um, be sure to stick around uh, for the entire presentation today because at the end we'll be sharing with you some freebie um, resources both from Chad and from Instrumental. Um, so more details to come after Chad's presentation. Um, so with that housekeeping out of the way, I'm very excited today to introduce Chad. Um, so Chad is the chief Str strategist and owner of Productive Fundraising, and he is a sought-after nonprofit fundraising speaker, master trainer, and coach. Productive Fundraising specializes in teaching the latest research-based fundraising tactics and making them approachable for small community-based nonprofit organizations. Chad has spent his entire career as a fundraiser. He has worked in large shops and small in a variety of sectors, um, such as higher education, social services, and the arts. Um, and the campaigns that he's worked on have raised in excess of $71 million for the charities that he's had the honor of serving. Um, so welcome, Chad. Um, and I just want to mention, we will be hopefully having a little bit of time for questions at the end. So if you do have a question, um, try to preface it with three pound symbols in the chat so that um, they're easier for us to find um, afterwards at the end. All right. Thank you very much. And take it away, Chad. Great. Well, thank you, Kat. Um, really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all for signing up. Um, you know, personal productivity is not always the most popular topic. So thank you for realizing that, you know, there's some room for improvement and um, could do a little better there. So um, I'm going to ask if we can go ahead and spotlight me. So um, I have the big screen there and then we'll get the slides up as well. And uh, we should get going here. So how to fix your productivity to amp up your results. I want to thank those of you that shared um, in the beginning uh, of what's your biggest challenge. Uh, we had some great chat there while we were waiting for everybody to come on. And there's the spotlight looking great. So uh, I'm going to dig right in and I'm going to start with a confession. Right? I have a little bit of an addiction. Um, uh, yes, it's not a horrible addiction, but I have an addiction to these, these personal productivity books. Um, these used to always come in the mail, uh, like the Amazon package, and they'd be on the front porch. My wife would see them and she'd say, oh, here goes the whole weekend. What are you reading? Now they go right to my Kindle, uh, which is fabulous. Uh, but yeah, I just love these books. I always like to be improving. So I've read, you know, tons of them. You know, there's many on my book stack back here. So uh, it's just me and how I'm wired. Um, I love checkboxes. I love to-do lists. Uh, there's a checkbox in my company logo. And uh, it has spread to my offspring. Uh, I found this in my... Um, son's backpack uh, a couple of years ago. I think he was maybe seven or eight. Uh, he is now, he turns 13 next month. Oh, that's crazy. Um, I love this one. Snuggle if enough time. So he was always our snuggler. Doesn't want to snuggle quite so much anymore. But yeah, it's just in the Barger DNA. Uh, we love productivity. I am a certifiable productivity nerd. Um, people ask me why. And when I look back, you know, it started in high school. I read one of those first books then. I was in a highly competitive high school marching band that practiced like six days a week and trying to do college prep and honors courses. And, you know, I just needed systems very early on. Then I was an AmeriCorps member while I was in college, a half-time AmeriCorps member while a full-time college student. That's a ton of stuff. Then I start dating and get engaged while in college and we get married two weeks after college while starting careers. So that's two things at once. 
Anytime I can put a photo of the lovely Mrs. Barger in a presentation, I will. And then these two uh, come around right about the time I'm starting my own business. So just lots going on and I needed those systems. I've just always had too much to do and not enough time in which to do it. Sound familiar? Right? This is kind of a universal problem. We're all on this scale at different levels, but we all have too much and not enough time. So that's why I started digging into this stuff um, and you know, just uh, really love it. I pull these gems out. I'm gonna share tons of stuff with you today. Some of it's gonna sound completely insane to you and you would never do it, but we're gonna find some, some gems and some ways for everybody. So uh, I don't need to tell you much about me. Uh, Kat read my bio there. I'm a career long fundraiser that just has this productivity nerd obsession as well. I've served uh, many of the organizations you see on this page. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about me at the end. Where am I coming to you from? Um, I live just outside of Hershey, Pennsylvania. And uh, whenever I'm doing a national or rather international webinar, I always ask the question, why do they make your Hershey bars in Hershey, Pennsylvania? Anybody wanna throw it in the chat there? Why in central Pennsylvania, kind of middle of nowhere? Uh, we, we don't grow cacao here. There we go, Heidi got it, cows, yes. It is Hershey's milk chocolate. So lots of dairy farms. Uh, if you haven't been to Hershey, Pennsylvania, I see all my locals here uh, chiming in, they're cheating, but come and, visit, come and visit us. You can take the factory tour and the cows will sing to you and tell you the story. So with that, let's hop right to it. So you're through my intro. Um, I have 25-ish, I'm always tweaking this, so I don't know exactly how many, personal productivity tips that the busy professional can implement to find more time, energy and attention to better serve their work and passions. So this is not all just work stuff today. We're going the full circle of everything we need to do. So time, energy, and attention are our three tools to better serve our work and our passions. Um, I'll give you some additional resources. And as Kat said, we'll uh, stick around at the end for any questions and comments. And as she said, please remember to put those three hashtags before you type it into the chat so we can be sure not to miss it and she'll cue those up for me when we get there. Uh, slides, free resources, recording, that will all come um, bundled up for you. And then I also have some additional things where you see on that link, productivefundraising.com slash resources. So just go over there, scroll to today's date and instrumental and everything will be listed. Before I get to these hacks, let's talk a tiny bit about what this productivity word really means. Uh, what are we really talking about here? And for me, productivity is really a combination of two things. The combination of both what we do and how we do it. You know, I kind of look at it like this, like this balance. Uh, and they kind of need to be in balance because it's not, we can do all the right things. And if we just work horribly and have all these bad habits, we're still not going to get anything done. Conversely, we can be incredibly efficient, uh, do, use our time, you know, stay on focus. But if we're doing the wrong stuff, it just doesn't matter. Uh, so that's why I do this presentation. This is the only non-fundraising presentation that I do because even if you are an amazing fundraiser, you have to layer on these work habits, skills, ways to manage your time, energy, and attention, or you're not gonna be the amazing fundraiser that you could be. So that la other word, uh, I keep using the word personal productivity. That's another key aspect, excuse me, another key aspect of this. It uh, isn't just productivity. You know, we can't just say, go do this. I'm giving you 25 things today in the hope that there might be three to five that you think will work for you. Um, I'm not going to show you my personal to-do list or task management system because it's only gonna work for about a quarter of you. So we'll look a little bit at that as well, but the key is it's personal. You gotta try things out. You can't just take somebody else's system and make it your own. All right, I'm ready to dive into some hacks here and um, we'll look at some, some things that have worked for me or I've seen work for others. Um, this is all tested and we're gonna start with time. Time is the number one complaint. When we were looking at the, uh, the pre-chat there, when we asked everybody, what's your biggest challenge? I would say over half of them use the word time. Not enough time, managing my time, my time being interrupted, all those types of things. So what are a couple things we can do to help with time. Oh, I put this slide up here and uh, some of you are already cringing. You're like, oh, 
who's going to tell me to do stuff first thing in the morning? And I'm not a morning person, right? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I am going to tell you to do things first thing in the morning, but I'm going to give you some options if you aren't. So this one is to own your mornings. Basically, I want you to find some time for you, some time for you to escape from the craziness of the day and have time for you. So for me, um, this was my technique when I was starting my business. I still had a full-time job and I wanted to get things going. At the time, my kids were young. So from uh, until about 7.30 in the morning, my house was completely quiet. So I just slowly moved uh, back my wake up time about 10 to 15 minutes a week as my body naturally adjusted to it. And then I started getting up um, back then it was at 5 a.m. And I had two and a half blissful hours before the world blew up and I could get things done in that time period. Now, conversely, my bedtime was moving forward, right? So we got to make sure we had that self-care and the sleep or this is all going to be uh, pointless but you can find that window. Um, when does that happen for you? And I'm seeing wonderful comments in here. This doesn't have to be for work. I needed it for work, but this could be for exercise, for uh, meditation. Somebody said meditation and yoga, um, reading, professional development, uh, just sitting, being with you still, a spiritual practice, anything. Time for you is what I'm after. For my people that are not uh, morning people, you can own your night, own your evening. Um, I have a good friend whose house got very quiet at 10 o'clock at night and he still had energy. So he wrote a novel in those two years, two years of just doing that, adjusting things. So find some time for you. I know other people that uh, have flexible work schedules and they can carve out like an hour in the middle of the day uh, when their energy is good, but find time for you. Don't go day in, day out without that time. I love that you're all sharing your, your most productive and times when you carve things out for you. We're gonna talk about knowing that most productive time. So own your morning or your evening, find time for you. My frog, all right, this one. This comes from one of the most um, popular productivity books of all time. It's called Eat That Frog by Brian Tracy. And yes, eat that frog. The concept here is we all have a frog. We all have this task that we don't really want to do, but it's going to move the needle forward. It's going to make big progress. Uh, maybe we're holding something up. You know, it's just pushing it forward. So the concept here is get in. As soon as you start your work, do that thing first. Then no matter what happens the rest of the day, the most important thing is done. You made some progress. I see Melanie saying taxes in there. Yeah, we gotta love it. So uh, whatever that frog is, get in, get it done. It sounds great in theory, but I can't do it. I can't do it because I just kind of dread starting every day if I gotta go in and do the big thing I don't wanna do. So I need something smaller. I start with a few tadpoles, right? Let me do tadpoles. These are like administrative tasks, you know, just quick little 10, five minute things just to get me going. That things I kind of like or enjoy and can move forward. So tadpoles, right? Then I can tackle the frog. So what's that look like for you? Um, tadpoles are not email. We don't want to start with the email. We're going to talk about email in the second half today, give you some tips there. That was the other main complaint in our pre-chat. Lots of people complaining about email. Um, <laughs> Ironically, I saw somebody uh, mention my, my lovely frog photo. This came from my friend, Alice, um, after we were doing the presentation together on personal productivity, Alice Ferris, um, fundraising extraordinaire. And uh, somebody during that session pointed out that um, the animal I had at the top there used to be my frog. And that is not a frog, yeah. So I did this presentation for six years using a toad to form a frog. So uh, productivity nerd, not biology nerd. Um, but that is my lovely frog photo from my good friend, Alice. So this comes from um, start your day uh, by eating the frog or start with a few tadpoles first. Um, eat that frog, 21 great ways to stop procrastinating and get more done in less time by Brian Tracy. All right, so let's get that key task done. Um, I wanted to give you some tips for calendar management. 
uh, because this is where I find my people can get the most improvement. Um, once they're carving time for them, they're making sure they're getting the right things done, then how we manage our calendar can really play a big role. So a couple techniques we can use. Time blocking. So literally putting tasks on your calendar. Um, anytime I get stressed and don't think there's enough time, I'll actually map out my day. Um, I don't love to always have every second mapped out, but uh, that's a big help for stress reduction for me. And don't forget time for professional development and reading. If you put it on a calendar, it usually happens, right? But those are things that we don't always do. That's the great value of a webinar. It's live at a certain time. Um, and if you miss it, what happens? You know, you get the recording, but you usually don't watch it because it's not on your calendar. You know, blocking time to actually watch that webinar recording would probably make sure it happens. Other things we can do, theming, right? Giving each day or hour a theme. So we have horizontal theming. From 11 to noon every day, I do, um, you know, grant research. Um, I check my tool. Um, I go to whatever and see what I need. I do donor thank yous at another time. Is there something that we need to do on a regular basis that if we just spent an hour, half hour a day, would get that ongoing progress? And some people can do vertical theme where they give each day of the week a theme. You know, um, Monday is grants day. Uh, Tuesday is uh, online engagement day. Wednesday is my admin day, whatever that is. Giving something done so you have a, um, a sense of, you know, I, I can plan my week. Where this correspondence came in, it's about grants. It can wait till Monday. That's my grants day. Just kind of gives you some more bandwidth. And my key for all of this is don't do what I did. Um, this is actually uh, a couple years old now, but this was like my ideal calendar at the time. And it's great. It's themed uh, both horizontally and vertically, but there's no margin, right? There's no margin. Leave room for the unexpected, right? And that includes that room for self-care and time to breathe. Don't plan every second of the day. But those are some great techniques. Um, if something of this resonated for you, I would just Google it. There is so many great uh, blog posts, other things out there on all of this. And I'll give you a resource for time management here in a little bit if you want to dig deeper. So what fundraising tasks might you want to consider blocking on your calendar? Throw that in the chat. Let us know. What is important that you want to make sure you have regular, consistent effort and progress that you might actually consider putting it on your calendar as a thank you? I'm seeing donor thank yous, call time, right. Um, I have people that block time for donor visits, which is great, but if you're gonna do that, you also have to block time for donor calls and scheduling those visits, right? Stewardship, pulling reports, deep work. I love it, I love it. Keep them coming, I'm gonna move forward here. To energy. Energy, what do we do then? Well, when do you feel like that? That's my question. When is your low energy time of day? You know, I have all different camps here. Some of you are the slow starters, right? It just takes you a while to get going, and then you're good. Um, a few of you are like a uh, late morning crash. You, you just get in, you're good, but then you need, need the, uh, the fuel from lunch to regroup. Many of you are my early afternoon post-lunch slumps, right? And then there's the group like me um, that three o'clock on, forget about it, right? The energy is done. Um, I actually don't present webinars later than 2 p.m. because it's just a different experience. I, I can't deliver as well. So know yourself. And uh, we're going to talk about what to do in that low energy window as we get a little farther along. But the key is just knowing that. So I'm seeing lots of comments with your times. So I'm glad that many of you do know that. If you don't, take some time. Think about it. Or maybe um, set up an annoying alarm to go off like every hour for a day and just ask yourself every time it goes off, what's my energy level like? Know and plan for that. We actually have something called chronotypes. Chronotypes. And this is how our body behaves. And we have four of them. They're fun animal names. You know, um, we have our kind of our standard is the bear. We follow the sun cycle. Lion is my morning people. The wolves are my night owls. And if none of this resonates and every day is different to you, you're probably a dolphin, right? You, just, uh, you usually don't sleep well, just a little bit all over the place. So um, we have lots of things to help bears, lions, and wolves. Dolphins, 
kind of got to play trial and error and see what works for you. But um, if you want to figure out your chronotype, if it doesn't make sense, on the resources page, I have linked up to a chronotype quiz. So, and even if you do know, it's just a fun activity for like a late Friday afternoon that's still quasi work. All right. So, what tasks should you be completing during that time? At low energy time of day, what should you be doing? Um, I kind of really like that to be email time. That should be your email time. Um, and I only want you to be doing email first thing in the morning if you're one of my slow starters. Right? Everybody else, get in, get to work, eat that frog or some tadpoles, but not just instantly spending our first half hour, 45 minutes, hour of the day in the email inbox. Thinking about that. Administrative tasks can also work really well for that low energy time of day. Let's look a little bit here at attention. Attention, what can we do with that? Well, a big mistake folks make is they try to fix their focus before they fix their energy. And energy is required in order to be able to focus. So I would say, you know, take these in order. Let's, what can I do to fix some time, find more time, realign my time? Then how can I make sure my energy is great? And energy relies a lot on, you know, nutrition, exercise, sleep, all the things we know we need to do, but don't always do a good job of doing, right? So managing that first. Then the last one, we can go to focus. All right, so what's he doing? He is multitasking, right? Multitasking. Can we actually multitask? Yeah, we can do some things. Um, I drive and listen to podcasts all the time, um, but we can't really focus well on two different things at the same time. What we're actually doing is switching back and forth rapidly. And that sounds fine, except that there's something called switching cost. Switching cost, right? So uh, scientists have studied this and we lose anywhere between 17 and 63 seconds every time we switch tasks. We're still doing stuff, but we're not at peak efficiency. So if we're going back and forth and back and forth all day long, you know, we go from our phone to our email, to someone at the door, to our task we're supposed to be working on, we can lose an hour of our day very quickly, simply by not focusing. So um, I saw this word come up a couple times in the chat, deep work. That's what we're aiming for. That concentrated time to focus, especially when we have a big project we need to work on. How do we find time for big, deep work? It's different for everybody. Um, some people, 20 minutes on one task is really hard. Some people can go three hours. Um, I find for most, like a 90 minute concentrated work um, session is just about perfect. But how do we go 90 minutes without being interrupted? Part of it is training our brain. And part of it is dealing with the other people uh, that the inputs come from. One of the great ways to start training your brain to be able to do more deep work is something called the Pomodoro technique. Um, so this is a real older um, productivity uh, style. It's been around a long time. Uh, this is one of those tomato kitchen timers. Uh, you don't have to use that. You can use something on your computer, uh, whatever. Uh, I don't recommend your phone. Because if you're using a timer on your phone, you're going to be tempted to look at things on your phone while you're adjusting the timer. Uh, you're going to check your notifications, other things. But the concept here is you're going to start out, set the timer for 15 minutes, and I'm not going to do anything else except my set task for these next 15 minutes. At the end of 15, take a five minute break where you can glance in your email inbox. You can look at your phone. I Hopefully you get up and walk around a little bit and then do it again. You're just gonna stack these cycles for maybe that 90 minute window that you have. In time, you can adjust the length of your Pomodoros. Maybe I'm gonna go 25 minutes and then a five minute break. I can go 45 and take a 10 minute break, but whatever, just kind of training that brain to focus. Train the brain to focus. The other way I train my brain is I have playlists. Um, as long as you're not one of those people that need complete silence to do work, this can work really well. Um, I have a playlist when I need to do deep work. Um, for me, I'm also a high school marching band and concert band nerd. So it's all like stuff I played back then, a lot of movie soundtracks, some John Williams, some How to Train Your Dragon, that kind of stuff, um, epic film scores. And my brain knows when that comes on that, okay, we're going to focus. 
And it's a 90 minute long playlist, right? It just knows it. It's at the point that it knows at what point we are in uh, the work session based on what song it's playing. So it's trainable. Similarly, when I'm gonna do one of these, I need to get my energy going. So I have an amp up playlist. It's uh, like 12 minutes long, right before I come on the Zoom and the pre-chat, I play that, get moving a little bit, get that energy up. And at the end of the day, when I need to turn it off, I have a playlist of, uh, it's all classic jazz. Um, you know, goes way back, just slows me down, eases in to the rest of the day. Um, and I'm seeing that music without words is the key for deep work. I completely agree. The only thing that has words is that relaxation and there's really not even much words in there because I prefer uh, classic jazz without vocals. So music, train our brain. But we need to really eliminate those distractions because those are the key thing that prevents us from deep work. So uh, what's the most distracting for most people? You know, these, the cell phone, it's with us all the time. Every single thing we download, every single thing we download has a default of notifications on. It wants to steal our energy, right? That's how a lot of them make money, but we can change that. So you decide, my phone does not notify me at all. Right? When I'm in deep work mode, and it knows what time of day that is, it doesn't notify, no notifications come through. The only thing that can get through is a text from my wife or kids or two calls in a row from their school. That's it. So I can get emergency notifications. Um, I did add my dad into that, I felt bad. So I, I added him too, but yeah, I am not disturbed during the day by my phone. So you are in control. I have a habit now. The second I put something on my phone, before I go anywhere else, I go into settings and I turn the notifications off for that. It's blocked from even sending them. Right? So you're in control, but you have to take control. This came up in the pre-chat too. Distra uh, distractions from the people we work with. You know, especially for those of us, uh, it's getting to be most of us that are back in offices now. Uh, we're back with coworkers. Um, some of us had coworkers uh, during home time too, which maybe were a little harder to manage than some of our other coworkers. But uh, this is actually a story about that. Um, one of my clients uh, had a two-year-old during quarantine time and needed to get work done. And they developed a system that she put this on the door, closed the door, and if it was green, could knock and come in. And if it was red, she couldn't. You know, there had to be an injury. Yes, there was another adult in the house supervising uh, the, the two-year-old, but you know, she would escape and come to mom's office. And uh, you know, it took a couple months, but she was trainable, right? She knew it worked. If you can train a two-year-old to do this, we can train our coworkers. Could we have this discussion? You know, is there a time of the day, maybe we horizontally theme deep work from 10 to 11.30 every morning, we are all gonna do deep work and not disturb each other. That is our office focus time. Rules like no Zooms on Tuesday and Thursday mornings so we can focus, a no meeting day. Let's kind of come and have this discussion together. What works for all of us that we can have these rules? There's Jessica says she does, they do no meeting Thursdays. I love it. Those kind of things can really help to block out room for deep work. All right, I wanna to transition to some other topics. I could talk about time, energy, and attention uh, all day, but instead I'm gonna lead you to a great resource that does that really well. Uh, the folks over at Asian Efficiency, uh, probably my top productivity source. Uh, they have a great podcast and tons and tons of free resources. So uh, there's the link to that. And I have it linked up on my resources page for all of you as well. So um, coming up here, I'm gonna do tips for more efficient meetings, and emails in our second half today, um, because those are usually the two biggest issue areas for most folks. But first, um, I want to toss it over here to Kat, who's going to give us a little bit of a demo of Instrumental and what it can do if you're not familiar with it. I have a couple clients that use Instrumental, and it is a big time saver uh, when it comes to grant research and uh, grant tracking, especially. I love the research uh, tool because basically, once you set it up, it does it for you. So I'm gonna to toss it to Kat and uh, she'll tell us a little bit more. Uh, thank you, Chad. So yeah, I'll be um, sharing my screens and showing you just a little bit about, just quickly, a few things in Instrumental that um, 
you can use to really save time and be more productive um, if you are someone who works with grants. Um, so the first thing I wanted to show you is um, something called um, the matches. So if for those who are not familiar with instrumental, um, basically it starts with kind of setting up these programs and projects in the tool um, that represent the programs or projects that you're specifically looking for funding for. Um, and then we automatically match your programs with funding opportunities. So if I click on my matches, I can see in this case, I have uh, 394 matches uh, grant opportunities that specifically match my criteria. Now, of course, you can kind of hone in there and make it more specific. Um, this is a very broad project. Um, you can also filter and sort, but these particular opportunities are active grant opportunities um, that you can actually apply for either through an LOI or um, a full proposal. Um, so the funder does accept applications. And this list is automatically updated. So anytime a new grant comes into the instrumental database that matches your particular um, project criteria, um, it automatically shows up here and, and you'll get an email about it um, notifying you that you have a new opportunity. So it kind of automates that grant prospecting um, the, uh, cycle for you so that you don't even have to spend time doing that anymore. You can kind of just like rely on Instrumental to send you um, the information um, that you need for your different programs. And this pulls together government, private, and corporate grants. Um, and then I just wanted to point out as well, this funder matches tab right here. Um, these are funders. So in addition to that list of active grants, you also get a list of any funder who does not have, let's say, a website or is invite only. So they may be a good fit for you based on who they funded in the past, but maybe they you have to like, you know, work on that relationship building um, side of things to get um, in touch with them. But those could still be great opportunities. Um, and in addition to being able to see all about um, that funder or grant opportunity here, you can um, read all about their um, like 990 information without actually having to go into the PDF, um, including like past grantees, um, even the size of grants they've given to new grantees versus um, repeat grantees. Um, and you can even search, you can even look at their past grantees and see who has other funders who have funded those grantees in the past. Um, so your research time is really like cut in half here because you don't have to be sourcing your grants from all sorts of different places. And you can easily access all that 990 data without having to pour through those PDFs um, and quickly decide if a grant is like a good fit or not. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to show you really quick was your tracker. So this is kind of the, the other part of instrumental. So we help with the prospecting, but we also help with the tracking. Um, so both pre-award and you can also track like your reporting and um, grants that have been awarded as well. Um, but so I'm sure many of you, if you do work with grants, have some sort of spreadsheet on your computer that has all your funders and all of the grants you're about to apply for. Um, with the deadlines and tasks. So this, our, the instrumental tracker essentially replaces that spreadsheet um, and makes it um, much more automatic so that you don't have to like be manually updating it and remember to do that. Um, so you can actually upload your spreadsheet to instrumental to get started, or you can just save grants directly from your matches and they show up here kind of in a spreadsheet format. So um, listed by month. So in terms of like time blocking, like Chad was talking about, you can set up your, you can easily visualize your um, grant calendar for the next, you know, year and, and, and try to say, okay, I have the capacity to apply for three grants each month. And so you can really set it up and visualize how you're going to be working on your um, grants over the next year. Um, and you can also see, you can like record your progress um, or your status, sorry. So if you're in, in the application process or if you've submitted or if you've been awarded um, and you can, you can actually use it to add tasks. So you can say, I want to have a draft done by Friday and instrumental will send you reminders um, for your tasks. And you can also assign tasks to different team members. So the co collaboration aspect becomes more automated as well. If you're working with multiple people um, to get a grant done. Um, and then finally, you can click on this little calendar thing here to see it as a calendar view. Um, so you can also kind of use this as like your grants calendar um, in a way if you prefer to look at, at it this way versus in spreadsheet format. 
Um, so that's just a couple really, really quick um, tips for how Instrumental can make your grants um, process a little bit faster and more efficient. And so I'll share the link in the chat again for starting your own uh, free trial of Instrumental. Um, and I'll, I'll send it back to Chad here. Great. Thank you, Kat. Um, yeah, I've uh, last two years or so uh, became aware of Instrumental. I, I actually met their team um, at a, a Florida State fundraising conference uh, two years ago, um, saw the product and really saw how, yeah, it could be very beneficial uh, for a productivity nerd that is always frustrated by um, lots of people that buy some kind of grant research tool, you know, $500,000 a year subscription, and then just don't have the time to use it or don't remember to use it. So that automation of that, um, I just love. And as I said, I have a couple of clients now using it. Um, works really, uh, it's, price point is, uh, it's always, you know, small shop conscious. They're always saying, oh, we can't spend money. But that's who it helps the best is those small shops that just don't have the time for all of this. So highly encourage you to check it out. And I am gonna switch us over and let's deal with those meetings and email, sorry. So meetings, <clears throat> sound familiar? You know, how often every week does this happen? You know, uh, yeah, a lot of our meetings could just be emails. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, but there's no punishment for doing it. So unfortunately that's not true. And you know, meetings are so bad, so bad that some graphic designer somewhere took the time to do this. This is the soul crushing meeting Fisher Price playset. Um, I love what it says on the side over here, um, go that way. Uh, now your kids can suffer just like you. Right? How much of our time is taken in these meetings? So. Let's talk, look at some ways we could potentially fix our meetings. Um, some of you recognize this person, um, had a, a popular book come out, oh, I think it's close to a decade now, and a little bit of a TV show. And what she wants us to do, she wants us to take our entire sock drawer and dump it on the floor and only put the socks back in the drawer that spark joy. Right? It's joy in our life, getting a little, little more minimalist, a little more organized. So. Marie Kondo your life. It was a big thing, right? Well, I want to Marie Kondo our meetings. Does this meeting spark joy? Right? Do you have meetings that you actually enjoy going to, right? That you actually like? You probably do, one or two. You know, um, it's probably a meeting that isn't as frequent. You probably get to see and interact with people you normally don't. Um, and maybe you're working together on a cause or project or something you actually like. Right? So it is possible. But the default is not meeting sparking joy. So uh, the ones that don't, how can we get rid of them or maybe minimize them, change them? That's what I want to look at here. All right. So does it spark joy? Let's go to our meeting. Here we are. Um, I use this slide in quite a few presentations. And I always say the only thing going well at this meeting is that they are really well hydrated. Um, I don't know why they have that much water, but uh, there's plenty. But no, nobody wants to be there. Right? Um, even the guy presenting, I, I don't know. So let's fix some things. First off, um, let's just get rid of some people. Right? I picked the two that look the least um, happy, and we're just going to get rid of them. Because sometimes we have these really big meetings, um, really big meetings, and there's just too many people there. We, there's so many people that not everybody can participate. If they can't participate, then we shouldn't be, we're using like 15 hours of staff time and maybe we could use eight, all right? So who actually needs to be here? Who isn't gonna be involved in the decision-making process or could just learn about things later by maybe reading a five minute summary, something like that, all right? So the rule I've heard on meetings um, is the two pizza rule and, uh, for those of you um, on the, uh, the West Coast or, or out there, my apologies. I know it's right before lunch for you and I put my pizza slide up, but uh, two pizza rule. What's it mean? Well, it's attributed to um, Jeff Bezos. I don't know if that's actually true or not, but basically the two pizza rule says you should be able to feed everybody lunch in your meeting with two pizzas. So if we're thinking, you know, maybe eight slices per pie, two slices each, it's kind of that eight to 10 is our meeting max if we want everybody to have a chance to participate, if we wanna hear from everybody. 
So two pizza rule. So let's just get people out there. 20, 30, 40 person meetings. No, that's more like a seminar or learning. It's not a collaborative meeting. All right, what else do I want to fix? What's he doing? What is he doing? He's presenting information. He's reporting information. That is not what meetings are for. We can do that in an email. Most of those meetings that could be an email are sharing information, right? We can share that information ahead of time with the expectation that we come to the meeting, having reviewed it, we've prepared, and we're gonna start the meeting by having a brief discussion. Are there any questions about the report, about the data? Uh, anybody have any ideas? And then we can get to the true purpose of the meeting, which is using the collective brain power in the room to strategize, brainstorm, um, troubleshoot, you know, all these things where we're actually using our brains and not just taking in more information. We have more efficient tools to take in information. So if you have a weekly team meeting and you spend the first half to two thirds of it just simply reporting to each other what you've been doing in the last week, not the most efficient. Right? You could have some kind of tool where at the end of the week, you do a little check-in, what I accomplished this week. And then Monday morning, everybody reviews it before the staff meeting and you know what each other is working on. And then we can use that meeting more efficiently or maybe even make it shorter. So no reports at meetings, no reports at meetings. If you're calling a meeting to do reports, not the right purpose, all right? I love this quote about meetings. Uh, this is Laura Vanderkam, a uh, great productivity expert. Something needs to change in the world as a result of any meeting, otherwise it shouldn't be a meeting. Meetings produce change or they produce this decision that will lead to change. If we're not making decisions in our meeting, it's probably not ideally a meeting. Right? Something in the world needs to change. And my last meeting tip for you all. Um, you've been in this meeting. It's a meeting that happens, it's usually a monthly meeting. Um, for me, it was always my development committee meeting. Uh, we'd be there, you know, staff and volunteers together, having a discussion, and I can see it's like five minutes towards the end of the meeting, and we've been having this discussion that just keeps going around in circles, and we're not getting anywhere, and I know we're not going to resolve it, and then we're going to show back up next month, same time and location, and what are we going to do? We're going to rehash the same exact conversation. So it happens all the time. I don't know why development committee meetings always seem to be the place, but yeah. So what are we going to do? Well, I started doing this. When I see that's happening, whether I call the meeting or not, I simply asked who is going to do what by when. Kind of goes like this. Um, folks, you know, we're getting close to the end of the meeting. Uh, we've been hashing this out for about 20 minutes. We're not getting anywhere. What information do we need that would make it easier to make this decision the next time? Okay, have that quick discussion. Who is going to get that and send it to the group? Or maybe we need to invite somebody to the next meeting that can help us with this, right? So who is going to do what by when? This helps us to not have the same meeting twice. Who is going to do what by when? All right, let's tackle that email inbox. Here we go. All right, this number. I have two groups of you. Uh, there one group sees this number, you are in pure panic, right? Oh my gosh, 179. It's like when I go away to a conference for three days and I come back and, oh, you are my inbox zero people. You just need to deal with it, get it done. You know, I, I'm in your camp, but that doesn't work for everybody. My other group um, says, that's nothing. If you put a zero at the end of that number, maybe I'll start to be worrying a little bit, right? They manage their email differently. They send stuff other places. I don't know how they do it, but two camps. So I'm not gonna teach you inbox zero. What I really want to do is just cut down on email altogether. Now, why? Average executive, 116 emails per day. And well, how much time does that take? It takes 28% of their work day, just reading and answering email, right? Oh, it's a lot, over a quarter of our day. Uh, it easily could swell to a third on a busy day. So just how do we spend less time typing away on emails? Um, so what's the biggest problem with email? They come back, right? You send an email and a reply comes back. 
And let's look at maybe a typical situation that you email a coworker at 9 a.m. They email back at 9.15. You reply at 9.45. It's back in your box at 11, 12, 1, 1 1.15, 1 1.30, 3, 4.30, 5. We just went back and forth like 10 times. What should that have been? That should not have been an email. That was a conversation that we just had in a tool not meant for conversation, right? Emails are a tool for sending reports and data and information. Um, yeah, so, whew, right. Um, maybe if we just send less email or we think, what should this be? Well, maybe it's a quick popping our head in the door or can we hop on Zoom for five minutes to figure this out later today rather than the big email conversation. So simply sending less email gets less back. So constantly thinking, you know, I at one point um, actually put a tiny little post-it note that I wrote stop on exactly where the send button on my computer screen is. Uh, so I thought like, do I actually want to send this email? Uh, it was the most annoying thing ever because I had this post-it note in the middle of my screen, but it trained me to send less email. So send fewer emails to minimize that boomerang effect. They come back, they come back. Here was the, the ultimate productivity book that I thought would save everything. You know, it sounded so great. Never check email in the morning, right? Uh, it's perfect for how I'm wired. I have energy in the morning. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna stay out of there and have all this productive time, but I couldn't do it couldn't do it. I was just sitting there doing my work and I was distracted by worrying about what might be in my email inbox, right? Well, I'm, worry can take the place of, of this. It's crazy. So this didn't work. Um, as much as I love jo Julie Morgenstern and wanted to, um, that didn't work, but I needed a system. I needed a way to deal with email. And remember that low energy time of day, what do we want to be doing with that low energy time of day? Email, right? Email and administrative tasks are our two best choices for there. Um, but my low energy time of day is three o'clock. And if I don't touch my email till then, you know, who knows what was going on? Um, I still reported to a board of directors, had a boss back then, like I had to monitor things a little bit. So that didn't work, but what did? Schedule and triage. Schedule and triage. So I still did the bulk of my email and it's true to this day. The bulk of my email is done at three o'clock. Pretty much any email reply is gonna be done at three o'clock for me. But I am gonna glance in the box, usually between sections of deep work um, and see what's in there. And if there's anything truly urgent, I'm going to take care of it right then. Otherwise it gets moved to three o'clock. And yeah, I'm an inbox zero person. So I literally drag it to my later today folder. It's pointless, but you know, it makes me feel better that it's not in there. But triage, this word, this is what happens when you're in the ER and have like a sprained arm and somebody with heart palpitations comes in and they rush in before you, right? they're dealing with the most urgent things first, right? Dealing with the most urgent things first and everything else can wait. There's a side benefit of this. I actually get less email because I do this because people have learned that they're not gonna hear from me until three o'clock. So they just kind of wait and, uh, or they maybe do a quick call or send it at other times, but I get like a third less email because I actually send it later in the day. So if you start your day with email and they know you're not gonna reply until the following day, unless it's truly urgent, people are trainable. Because what is in most emails? Email for the most part is made up of other people's problems, right? things they need from you. So don't give your best energy time uh, for other people's problems. My final few tips for you, this thing we try to do, this work-life balance, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's nearly impossible. The second you get it in balance, it shifts again. So quit trying to do this. Quit trying to balance all the things, right? Instead, let's seek some harmony, right? I like the phrase work-life harmony, not balance. Now, balance is temporary. Harmony can be lasting. It's okay if I have to spend more time on work this month because we have a major gala or I have all these grant deadlines. But maybe the next month I can shift 
can spend more time with friends, family, self-care, those kind of things. It just has to go back and forth. It can't stay stuck one way all the time. Work-life harmony. I actually snapped this in an office once, thought it was great. It's so true. We don't let our phone batteries die, but sometimes we run ourselves into the ground. Self-care is a priority, not a luxury. Schedule self-care. Put it on your calendar. Work out, take a walk, read, think, sit in silence, any of it. It's just as important as the meeting. You need time where you do things like this, or this, or this journaling, whatever it is for you that gets you in the right headspace. And I say everybody needs some synthesizing time. Very hard word for me to say, synthesizing. And uh, what is that? Analog hobby, right? So something with no digital inputs. Practice weekly, synthesizing time. For me, it's hiking. I like to go on a big hike every week. Um, it's when I get my best ideas. It's when my brain can connect the dots. Like all the best ideas have come to me when I'm out on a trail. The other place this naturally happens is in the shower, but that's not long enough, right? Uh, we're wasting water if we're in there synthesizing too long. So find out what that is for you. Uh, maybe it's crochet or a bike ride, flying a kite. Um, some of us have habits we picked up two years ago of baking sourdough bread. And if you're not listening to a podcast while you do it, it can work. But what is that time for you? Get obsessed with it. Um, I'm in all these hiking groups. I volunteer or with trail maintenance. Like it just kind of grew to something. Be obsessed with something other than your job. It'll make you happier, healthier, and actually more successful and better at that job. Right? We just need to get out of our own heads sometimes. Those are my 25-ish tips. Uh, my last tip for you, don't do all of these things at once. Pick two. Pick two things you like today. Try them for 30 days. There might be some friction at first that might feel weird. Give it a try for 30 days, then reevaluate it. Is this working for me? If not, get rid of it. Yes, make it permanent. And then if there's a few other things you wanna try, keep on going. But just this continuous improvement, not doing all this stuff at once. Okay, um, if you would like to get in touch with me after the fact, um, and I have some additional resources here for you, um, my website is productivefundraising.com. You can find me on all the social channels as Fundraiser Chad. Um, I'm not on TikTok. I don't know what to do on there. I don't dance. And so, uh, but everywhere else, it's Fundraiser Chad. Um, if you'd like to check out Instrumental, um, uh, the link is there. And we do have that discount code. So be sure to uh, grab that and write that down as well. Um, uh, I highlighted my resources page where there's um, some follow-up materials like that chronotype quiz, a few other things. And uh, Kat has, oh, no, nope, I still have one more thing. <laughs> um, I'm just launching this. So um, doing a personal productivity tip of the week. Um, so, you know, if you don't have the time to learn this stuff, but you find it valuable, you want a quick email with just one thing, I'm not going to give you this giant, huge list of tips. One thing per week, I'm going to probably send it out most Fridays. Hit that QR code or there's a link in the resources page and I'm um, happy to do that for you. So. My firm is Productive Fundraising. Uh, we do board and staff fundraising training, coaching for fundraisers and nonprofit executive directors, and onboarding coaching for staff new to fundraising. As you all know, it is impossible to find fundraising staff these days. Um, I also do a free monthly webinar. This month, we're doing monthly giving, um, how to set up a program, grow a program, and optimize a program. If you want some tips from there, it's the 23rd at 1 Eastern, and the sign up for that is on the resources page as well. And uh, I'll let Kat tell us about some uh, fun freebies that we have, both of you have for today. Great. Thank you so much, Chad. That was extremely helpful. Um, it looks like we have about five minutes, so um, I'll just kind of wrap it up here. I'm going to um, uh, tell you a little bit about these freebies, and then we'll go into like a few questions for Chad, if anyone has any. Um, so... Today we'll be giving away, um, Instrumental will be giving away 10 best lessons from 10 grant writing experts guide. And Chad will also be giving away a guide called five steps to far, uh, smarter fundraising. Um, so all you'll have to do is click the link um, in the chat that I'm going to add. And we'll also be sending this out afterwards. And then you can um, receive those freebies. Um, so I'll drop that in the chat right now. And now let's open it up to some questions. 
Um, so here, I, I, I will um, send these to Chad. Um, so Chad, the first question we got was um, advice about how to get started with time blocking. Um, think, think about work category, category buckets. So I guess, do you have any advice on um, getting yeah. started? Definitely. I like that. Um, let's think about work category buckets. Um, so rather than like there was a suggestion of like donor thank you notes. Well, we could, but what if we didn't really get many donations this week? So instead, maybe it's a stewardship time block that I'm going to do donor stewardship on uh, 10 to noon on Friday mornings um, and maybe one or two um, not filling up our whole schedule. Um, a great activity I like to do is um, putting together your ideal day. Like if I had my way, how would I spend my ideal work day? What would I work on when? So maybe do that activity and then just pick one of those. You know, not many meetings happen at this time. I think I can get away with putting this here. Try it for a couple of weeks, see how it goes, and then maybe try another one um, and see what that's like. But don't fill the whole thing. Make sure there's some margin. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, um, what if you have an all staff meeting with 15 to 20 people weekly and it's the only time most staff actually sees each other? So I guess I was asking your opinion about that kind of a meeting. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying don't do team building or kind of the growth. And I think that's definitely necessary. I'm saying don't do that by simply telling everybody what you've done for the last week. Um, maybe instead we could do an activity or do networking or something like that. Like we get our status report in some other way and we each, you know, spend 15 minutes reading everybody's status reports. And then we could actually do something which deepens our connection with each other, maybe learning more about each other or learning together rather than just learning what everybody's been doing. Great. Um, and then I think we'll have time for about two more. So one is... Uh, do you have any tips for running a board meeting more effectively? Um, definitely. So the big thing I see with board meetings is that we spend the whole first half on reports. Um, so a very common tool is a consent agenda. So we're going to take all the reports, um, you know, the executive director's report, the development report, uh, the programming report, whatever reports we have, they come out to the board like five days before. Um, I usually like there to be a weekend in there. Um, and their expectation is that you read them, you come to the meeting with any questions, and we go from there. The chair, the first thing they say after calling the meeting to order is, uh, first item is our consent agenda. Does anybody have any questions? We deal with questions and a motion to accept the uh, consent agenda, and we move forward. Um, I don't like to put financial reports in the consent agenda. I send them ahead of time but I think it's valuable for the board to actually spend a little bit of time looking at those in meeting, but even still doing the financials, you can be through all the reports in the first 10 minutes of the meeting and then get to strategy discussion. I'll do one other quick tip there. Um, I find biggest problem with board meetings is they're so distanced from the mission. Um, you know, they're in a static room. Maybe they're at a, a board member's office, not even where we do our programming. And it's boring stuff. It's financials and policies and, you know, bring the mission to it. So starting with something like a mission moment, like five minutes of uh, this great thing that happened since the last meeting, telling a story, bringing somebody in to talk about, you know, the way their life was changed. Incredibly powerful. And it takes all the little petty issues in the board meeting. They go away and the conversation turns to, wow, that was great. How do we do more of that? And we get to this wonderful discussion. Great. Um, so that's time, everyone. So if your question wasn't answered, um, keep an eye out for our follow up email and we'll be sharing like Chad's contact info that he shared earlier in the slides in the recording. Um, and then if you enjoyed this um, grant workshop, you'll love our next one. It's on March 8th and it's called How to Use an Agile Framework to Write and Win More Grants with Diane Leonard. Um, so you can register on our events calendar, um, which we'll include in the follow up email as well. Um, so thank you very much and have a great day. Take care, everyone. Thank you.